But in essence, we're seven small projects collaborating across the four regional archaeological trusts, the Royal Commission for Wales and CADU. And we are uh, trying to work together to achieve these, these two aims. Now, in our development phase for the, for the lottery bid, we tootled around Wales and we consulted, and I can't remember the figures, with about 80 different youth groups around the whole of Wales, from schools to youth clubs, council run, voluntary, vol voluntarily run, um, with pupil referral units, with a whole range of people who would actually talk to us. <coughs> and in doing that, to be fair, we had to take on the chin some fairly hard <coughs> criticism about what we were already doing, and stuff we thought we were quite good at, which apparently we're shit at, if you'll excuse the language. That's what one of our groups told us <coughs> quite <coughs> bluntly. Um, having developed my th thicker skin than I started with, I uh, distilled all of our consultation responses together and I came up with a list of reasons why young people don't, involve, don't engage voluntarily in heritage. It's boring. It's for old people. I can't afford it. I don't understand it. And it's too far away. I've grouped stuff roughly, but those are pretty much the themes which, which came out. Some of these we can deal with quite nicely, quite easily, actually. Um, so, it's boring. Well, okay, we'll try and do some fun stuff with it then. We'll try and link stuff we know because you've told us that you're already interested in. We're doing a lot of photography, we're doing a lot of creative arts, we're doing some stuff with virtual reality, with augmented reality. We're, we're not talking about archaeology very much, we're not even talking about heritage very much but we're talking about the place that people live in and using places to do exciting stuff. It's for old people. Well, we're kind of getting around that by getting our young people to design the project with us. We're not doing it for them, we're doing it with them. I can't afford it. Thank you, Lottery Fund. Brilliant. I don't understand it. Well, that's kind of our problem then if we're not explaining it very well. So that's something we're working on. And this was the really key one, and this is the one I want to think about today. It's too far away. Now, one of my groups live up in the Rhondda Valley, so they're not that far from Cardiff. What is it, 20 miles? Mm. And as one of them said to me, I'd love to go to the museum, but it takes an hour on the bus, so I can't be bothered. Mm. Okay, so it's physically quite a long way away. When you unpick that statement a bit more, why is heritage too far away? Mm. Actually, it's not. It's all the stuff that's around you. And we're, that's the view of heritage we're trying to get people to think about now to think about answering the question, why does this place look like it does? What is it in the landscape or the streetscape or whatever which makes this our place? And that's where we're trying to turn around this view of it's too far away. So I want to tell you two very quick stories. One is about a tree, which sounds a bit bizarre. Um, one of our groups, the Valleys Group, uh, were, are looking at a place called Fernhill Colliery. Fernhill was one of the biggest collieries at the head of the Rhondda Valley. It's one of the reasons the Rhondda looks like it does. In the aftermath of Aberfan, the big disaster where the spoil tip slips down the hill, so on, reasonably enough, the coal board wanted to make safe a lot of their other colliery sites, and they demolished Fernhill. There is no trace of Fernhill at a casual site. This enormous colliery is not there. All the workers' housing that went with it is gone, and in doing so, the whole shape of the valley changes. So our kids who live two miles down the road have always played at the Fernhill site, but they've never thought of it as being a heritage site. It's just something which is on their doorstep. Um, we've done a whole load of different bits of work that they've suggested. We've suggested stuff to them. We've done all manner of things. And last Friday, I took them to the archives, the Glamorgan archives. This took some doing with a 13-year-old boy and a number of his mates. But uh, they were moderately engaged with the old maps and moderately engaged with the photographs until we got the magnifying glass and the aerial photographs out, and then one of our boys sat there and he was peering over this photograph. He said, I found a tree. Great, good, well done. <laughs> he said, no, 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 he said, I was there yesterday. Okay, fair do. So it turns out his, far, his family had got a farm, he was helping them move the cows, and he went past this tree, which he recognised on an aerial photograph. So we backtracked it to the first edition of the survey, and there's the tree. And we backtracked it a bit more, and there's the tree. So, you know, he was quite excited about this. <coughs> Weird. Sunday night, my phone pings about half a second, and I'm sat on the sofa thinking, oh, what? And it's a WhatsApp group I've got with the, with the young people there. And I thought, I don't want to know. They send me so much rubbish through the WhatsApp group. It's hilarious. 
And he sent me, some of you will be able to see it, he sent me this, which is a picture of a tree. So on Sunday, this 13-year-old lad, who doesn't do particularly well in school, has gone out voluntarily and photographed a tree and <laughs> sent it around, because that's his connection with that place. I thought that was really interesting. It's really quite, quite powerful. <coughs> the other thing I just want to really briefly um, talk about, and then I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Hand these round if you like, and if you want to keep any of them, please feel free. They're a little present. Um, this is from a group in, in Tlethi. Now, they are a pupil referral unit, so they're all kids who've got various different issues going on in their home life or academic achievement issues or whatever. Um, and we have done various bits of work about Tlethi, and in our consultation, one of them said, I didn't realise anyone interesting ever came to Tlethi. Tlethi is a post-industrial <coughs> town. It has really not a lot going on, except two out-of-town shopping centres, interestingly enough, which are probably the reason why it looks like it does. So our Tlethi group have gone out into the middle of town with a professional photographer, and they've learned about taking photographs. And they've done all the processing and editing themselves, and they've selected this set of photographs. And I think they're quite telling. I think they're quite damning, actually, when you look at a lot of them. Some of them are quite beautiful and quite lovely images. But this is what the kids are seeing, and this is how they see their town. And one of them said afterwards that they had never looked at the centre of town before. They walk through it and they see the empty shops, but they've never actually looked at the centre of town before. And doing it through an activity like photography gave them the chance to think about what was going on in their town. Um, and this set of uh, postcards are, are the result. Think what you will of them. Um, as an aside, they're also being submitted into uh, accreditation through Arts Award. So the children are also getting something out of this in terms of qualifications. The reason I bring these two things up is because we never set out with this project to do what you might call placemaking. We set out to connect people to heritage. And if that's the same thing, well, great, maybe it is, I don't know. Um, but we also set out to take young people's voices seriously. And I've also got these with me. This is um, the, the programme of a conference we held, a conference and event we held end of October. And the reason I've brought these is just to demonstrate that we are, across the heritage and culture sector in Wales, really thinking very seriously about taking young people's voices uh, into account and, and taking them into decision making. So I don't really have any answers, but my question here, if we're serious about placemaking and if we're serious about taking young people's voices into consideration, what do I do with my tree, which is that point of connection? And what do I do with the town centre, which looks like this, that no one has ever thought about before, or that these young people have never thought about before? Because what happens in Cleffley, as in common with a lot of Welsh towns, and I'm looking at you because I know you'll back me up on this, is the young people grow up, move away, and maybe come back 20 years later, or maybe don't. And I suppose here, the question is, yeah, if we're serious about taking young people into consideration, how do we do that when they don't particularly want to think about heritage and they certainly don't want to be bothered with planning and placemaking and all of this complicated stuff? I don't have any answers, but I thought they were quite interesting questions. Um, I think you're doing it because you're, you're, you're giving ownership back. And, and sometimes we need to be reminded of what we all learn. Yeah. And we all learn the heritage around us. So I think what you're doing is, is doing that and you're stimulating something. That's what we're trying to do, and I guess what I'm worried about is taking it that next step onwards and actually seeing tangible changes. We're in early days, in fairness. We've got another two years' worth of project work to do, and this is such a kind of slow, careful process, in a way. But I'm really heartened to hear that, because that's exactly what we're trying to do. I mean, this is only two of our, our seven projects, and one of our other projects is, is in Swansea, where we're looking at skateboarding heritage. I know nothing about skateboarding. I was rubbish at it in the 80s, I'd probably be even more rubbish now. Um, but Swansea was an absolute hotbed for the development of UK skateboarding. Apparently it's where it all happened and it's where it all went on. Um, and one of the, the young people from Swansea asked me the other day, why isn't there a skateboard ramp at St Fagans at the Museum of Welsh Life? Because that's where all the important buildings get transplanted to, to be part of Welsh culture and Welsh heritage. And I thought to myself, do you know what, that's a fair question. And I'm going to ask the curator next time I see him and see what he says. Um, but it's a really fair question. I was really sceptical about the Swansea project and about skateboarding heritage, and I did find myself thinking, what? I just didn't, it didn't compute for me. 
Um, and then it was explained to me in that, and this is my vagueness, I'm sorry, there's a chap called Jono who was massive in the skateboarding scene in the 80s, and he apparently invented a classic skateboarding trick, which I couldn't even begin to describe. And he invented it on a particular wall in Swansea. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that's a wall. But if you were in that particular scene, in that particular mindset, that's really important. People come to Swansea to look at that wall. But the city planners are never going to take that into consideration at the moment. It's not on the HER, it's not, you know, it's not, it will be, because we're going to put it on the HER, which is going to lead to some interesting conversations as well, I think. Um, and I did have quite a nice slide of a rail in the now demolished uh, Quadrant shopping centre in Swansea with kind of um, scratch marks down the side where all the kids skateboard down the rail and it's a kind of rite of passage that they now can't do because it's been demolished which most of us would say hurrah or it was pig ugly and it needed to go but it's that alternative view of heritage and alternative voices and diversifying voices is where I'm kind of going with this.